I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we discuss Russia's massive overnight missile strike on Ukraine, analyse the dramatic developments this week in Georgia, and I speak to Katerina Stepanenko, a Russia analyst at the Institute for the Study of War. We speak about Russia's mobilisation effort, information warfare, and try to get inside the numerous pro-Russia telegram groups. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. We need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield, to win the war. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Thursday, the 9th of March, one year and 13 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today I'm joined by our associate editor Dominic Nichols, foreign correspondent James Kilner, and later by Katerina Stepanenko from the Institute of the Study of War. I started by asking Dom for the latest from Ukraine. Well, hi, David. Hi, everybody. Yeah, big night of air attacks. So missiles and drones. Ukrainian Air Force saying Russia launched 81 missiles and eight drones. The missiles, including six Kinzhal hypersonic missiles. So we've looked at these before. The, uh, the, The thing about those is that they come down at a very acute angle, basically straight down, and are going so fast that they are almost impossible to to intercept and and, and have any effect against um, that's the hypersonic missiles now the targets it was pretty much across the whole country so kiev the capital Kharkiv, the second city in the northeast chernihiv to the north lviv in the west and nipro in the center and lutsk which is out uh, to the to the west on the way or just sort of slightly northeast of of lviv the zaporizhia nuclear plant was also hit left running on diesel generators and the International Atomic Energy Agency director, Rafael Grossi, he is reported to have told the agency's board of governors, referring to the possibility of a nuclear accident, reported to have said, quote, I'm astonished by the complacency. What are we doing to prevent this happening? Each time we are rolling a dice. And if we allow this to continue time after time, then one day our luck will run out, unquote. So, I mean, it matters not what Russia say about it. I will just mention the the, the reference from from their Ministry of Defence because I want to make a make a point about it. But the Russian Ministry of Defence has said that the the missile strikes a retaliation for what they're calling the terrorist attack in Russia's Bryansk region, which borders Ukraine last week. Right. So ignore what they said. Okay, it's nonsense. They they are they are doing this because it's all they can do. They are. Um, producing very low tens of these missiles per month. That's why we think the tempo of these big air attacks is now stretching out to sort of two weeks, three weeks, because that's all they've all they're able to do. And um, they're still going for the critical national infrastructure. I mean, that, that's putting a that's putting a strategic gloss on it, if you like. I mean, you could say it's just terrorism. It's it's a bit of both, I think. It's not working against the critical national infrastructure. We heard yesterday how the lights, the street lights, are back on in Kharkiv. But it's what they're what they're able to do. We're coming out of winter, thankfully, so that the the attacks on the water and power are having less and less impact. But it's all all that Russia can do. They can't. They're going nowhere on the battlefield. They're not able to progress their aims. They're back down to the old ideas of massive air air bombardment and then see what's left so that's what they're able to do now the mod russian mod say it's in retaliation for this cross-border raid thing last week which is still very murky we don't know exactly what what went on but it's almost certain that it was not a a ukrainian affiliated or members of ukrainian military or ukrainian planned attack it seems to be people who believe in the ukrainian cause but have not were not assisted by or in any way part of the Ukrainian military. It looks that way. Now, th- that's going to happen. The, these things are these people are are out there. But Russia, by saying, "All oh, right, well, we've just launched these eighty one um, eighty one missiles at you because of, because of that," they're trying to frame the debate to say that any attack on their well, any attack anywhere is is state sponsored by Ukraine. And they're doing that for two reasons. They're doing it to as as a as a fig leaf for trying and, try and cover up their that they're not just lobbing missiles around and repurposed anti ship missiles using using them on land. So they're extremely inaccurate and therefore hitting things that they they shouldn't be hitting and, and causing civilian deaths. So they're saying, well, we're we're not doing that 
because we're nasty. We're doing that because you're you're attacking us. But also domestically, they're saying that they're, they're, they're shoring up this idea, this narrative they're trying to form in domestic for their domestic politics to say, look, oh, God, you know, Ukraine, they're, they're doing everything that any any anything bad that happens, it's all to do with Ukraine. And therefore, you've got to you've got to believe in um, Uncle Vlad and, you know, we're going to take some pain. But hey, it's all it's all for the good. So I think it's it's utter nonsense as usual but an effort to frame the debate. There have been deaths reported across the country, across Ukraine, uh, on a, as a result of these strikes. Low numbers at the moment, thankfully, not, not into double figures the last time I checked. Um, not that that makes it any, any better, really. But we'll obviously keep, keep an eye on this. Separately, what else is going on? So Avril Haines, the US Director of National Intelligence, she was in front of a Senate committee yesterday and she said that um, Russia will need to begin a mandatory mobilisation and receive a flood of weapons from China if it is to make any major territorial gains in Ukraine this year. She was saying that Russia's military lacks the ammunition and troops necessary to sustain its current level of fighting and may be forced to shift to uh, what she describes as a hold and defend strategy and said that Putin appears to be focused more on more modest military objectives now. That last bit was a direct quote. Appears to be focused on more modest military objectives now, unquote, uh, Avril Haines said. I think that's that's probably accurate. I think that's what um, all they all they can do. They are content to do this grinding advance in the in the Donbass. They are very content to allow Wagner to to take the uh, to, to be the lead on on that. And and I think that's that's all that's going to happen for the for the near term. Now, Ukraine also seem to be content that that is the fight that they are receiving, because what they are doing, as we've said before, written about, spoken here, they are buying time. But Donbass and and the fight around Bakhmut is buying time, uh, wearing down the, the Russian forces, but bu- importantly buying time for the, the eventual combined arms military, a combined arms force to get in the field. And as we said, so the training on tanks and artillery systems and air defence seems to be moving from individual soldiers learning about those weapon systems. It's, we now understand it to have stepped up a level and they're now doing sort of squadron level attacks, exercising squadron level attacks in the tanks, so sort of a dozen or so tanks the next level after that will be right well let's marry it all together and let's let's exercise the tanks working with the infantry working with the engineers working with the artillery so on and so forth so that's the sort of next level and only then do we think ukraine will launch this this big metal fist into russia's flank and that's not expected until late spring summer so donbass the fight in the back mood is buying time for that. It seems to be a fight that both sides are content to have, but for very different reasons. And I think Ukraine's reason is correct. Russia's reason, which is they just like taking territory and planting flags, is is stupid. But I'm I'm happy for them to continue doing it. Georgia, we'll hear more about in a moment from from James, and then I will come back a little bit later to talk about chatting to Svetlana Sikhanskaya yesterday, who's Belarusian, the, the the Belarusian opposition leader. But I'll take a break there. Thanks very much for that, Dom. Uh, Just two things from me quickly. One question for you, Dom, but I'll come to that in a moment. I just want to flag something from regular guest Hamish de Bretton-Gordon. He's asked us just in in the light of of yesterday's strike, this morning's strike on the Zafirisia nuclear power station, that there is a a useful app that gives out safety advice. It's called Safety Advice Nuclear Incident on Telegram. That's available in English and Ukrainian. uh, If you want some of the basic simple things that to know some of the basic simple things that you can do in Ukraine or elsewhere, if, if a disaster like this did occur. Uh, So in the Telegram app you need to search TF26UK. That's for the Ukrainian version I believe and for the English version uh, tf 26 so do do have a look at that and thank you Hamish for for flagging that to us. Dom just a very quick question to you that's occurred to me just on some of the things you were saying. I think over the last year we've had a a very good impression, as you've described it day in day out, of what the Russian army is like on the offensive, how it how it does it, what it aims, to, you know, the, the methods it uses to achieve its goals, uh, its strategic objectives, etc. Do we have any sense from the last year, or even over the last twenty years, of what the Russian army is like on the def- on the defensive? I, I mean, the answer might be none at all, of course. We don't have a great idea, to be perfectly honest, because what we've seen in recent years, so in Chechnya, when they started going backwards, they they relied on massed artillery and destroying all that they can see in front of them and, and in a way of in a way to go forward i mean they are content to to take casualties if it's part of the bigger plan and of course they don't have their system is so rigid that they don't allow low level commanders to respond in an innovative manner to the problem set that they're presented with so 
if if the big boss doesn't say you can you can move your position you can withdraw from that position take up a more a more sensible defensive position and counterattack if they're not told to either do that or that they can do that then they don't they they just sit and fight it out and and um and suffer accordingly so no we've not really seen them on the back foot of course in syria we didn't see well we saw virtually nothing of the russian army that was more a russian air campaign we saw a little bit of of them on the ground but it was mainly wagner and i think it was 2000 where was it 2018 when wagner got badly badly smashed up by the us us air force um i can't remember the exact date but yeah so we've seen virtually none of nothing of of the russian military on the ground elsewhere around the world again mainly wagner in sort of africa and and um, south america so we've not re- not seen them, not seen the regular Russian army, and not seen them in in a in a big fight. So it's difficult to tell. I mean, Russia has been going through a military transformation, or trying to go through a military transformation for the last twenty odd years. The, the end of the Cold War kind of caught them a bit by surprise. It took them ten years to work out that they needed to needed to change. So just after, or as the West was generally going through this, what was called a revolution in military affairs, i.e precision came in gulf one early 90s was the first time we really saw precision weapons i know they were used it to to some degree in vietnam and you can trace it all the way back to the second world war but basically it was gulf one where we started seeing this shift between how many planes does it take to drop a bridge turns into how many bridges can a single plane drop that's that's precision in a nutshell and it was really gulf one where where we the public well actually i was (laughs) In fact, no, I wasn't serving then. I wasn't serving in Gulf 1. I fought it on the floor of the stock market. Anyway, that's another story. Yeah, that was when precision came in. The West grabbed it quickly, aided by great technology in Sil- Silicon Valley especially, and uh, and sort of ran ran with that. Russia came to that party very late, tried to transform its military, hasn't really worked, didn't really know what it wanted because the, the, these old ideas of mass were still fixing their strategic mindset to a great degree. And whilst there were some people... You know, and you can point to Grasimov to a certain degree here, who who were suggesting different modes of warfare or different ways of of warfare. What we've seen is when they hit a big problem, like Chechnya and and today in Ukraine, they very very quickly revert to type and the old route one, the haymaker, they just pummel the place with artillery and then send the troops in afterwards. And if any troops survive, great. That old model is is only just below the surface in the Russian military mindset, and they reach for it very very rapidly when when um, when they hit a problem. So I think that's what we've seen here. And whilst there might be some the occasional flash of 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 a of an idea that we would recognise, I'm thinking the the withdrawal from Herzon, for example, that was a that was a very efficient operational withdrawal by by Russia. I have to say, you know, we so we do see these flashes of what they what they should be doing and maybe what they can do. But the vast majority, the big, the big beast, is still very much grounded in just smash the place up and and walk in afterwards. So no, we don't get a great idea of how agile they are going backwards. I th- I've got a feeling in the next few months we might do. Thank you very much for that, Dom. That was really illuminating. James, can I come to you? Thank you so much for joining. It's been a week of astonishing news and 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 um, developments in Georgia. So we knew we had to speak to you about this. Could you just bring us up to speed? What's the latest from Georgia? Hi David, thanks for having me. So, yes, as, as you say, it's been a very dramatic few days in Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia. Uh, on Tuesday, Parliament, which is dominated by the ruling Georgian Dream Coalition Party, passed the first reading of a law which has been dubbed the Foreign Agents Law, which is sort of, sort of a law which will impose more uh, burdensome paperwork tag, which is considered a stigma. Um, for all NGOs and, and media groups, which, have, which receive more than 20% of their funding from overseas. It's very similar to a law brought in, uh, a law brought in to Russia in 2012. This triggered absolute outrage by, uh, f- from thousands of Georgians who took to the streets. And on Tuesday and Wednesday, there were clashes with police. Certainly on Tuesday, there were moments of cocktails thrown. Protesters were trying to break into parliament. Riot police were charging protesters, water cannons used, tear gas, that sort of thing. Similar sort of thing on Wednesday night, although no reports of Molotov cocktails, etc. But, but a very, very angry crowd waving the Georgian flag, uh, the EU flag, and the and the you know, Ukrainian flag. So they, they consider this whole foreign agents law 
which the Georgian government wants to impose and, and look like they were going to, as um, a shift towards the Kremlin and a shift away from the EU and the West, which is a, a very important dynamic for most Georgians. Some of my posts show about 85% of Georgians want to join the EU, they want to be Western. Anyway, the, the situation on the ground was clearly deteriorating and tempers were getting more and more frayed, et cetera, et cetera. And now, we, and now today, the parliament has scrapped the law as it is. And they said they're going to hold consultations with public to with the public to try and explain to them more clearly why they feel this law is necessary in in their eyes. And their arguments are basically it's a national security issue. We should know more clearly where NGOs and media organisations get their funding from. This sort of thing. So big big drama in Tbilisi uh, this week. And today we're we're sort of back where we were. Uh, at the beginning of the week with this law now taken off the books and people trying to work out what's going on and um, what to do next. Thank you very much for that, James. C- could you give us a little bit of a posit history of, of modern Georgia, its relationships with, with Russia and the West? I mean, I'm sure we have to talk about 2008 and the war there, just to put everything you've said in, into some historical and political context. Sure. So as, as I mentioned, Georgia's been on this westward trajectory really since about 2003, when um, perhaps the original color revolution, the Rose, Rose Revolution, kicked out the last um, Edward Shevardnadze, the last sort of Mikhail Gorbachev's uh, Gorbachev's foreign minister, the last sort of Soviet bastion in Georgia, and then up up came this charismatic character Mikhail Saakashvili, who became president in 2004, and he was determined to take Georgia on this very pro Western EU trajectory. And he set that in motion, and this this seriously angered the Kremlin. And, and this was the first, uh, surely followed by Ukraine, but I think this was the first time that one of the first times with, with Ukraine and the Orange Orange Revolution uh, that um, the Kremlin's power over its ex-Soviet hegemony had had really been tested. And five uh, four years after, and so so Saakashvili and Putin became you know serious enemies. And within four years, there was a brief war in uh, August 2008, five-day war, centered around one of two frozen conflicts that the Russia, that the Kremlin has um, kept going in Georgia, one in South Ossetia and one in a place called Abkhazia. South Ossetia and Abkhazia sort of tried to become independent states in the chaos of the 1990s after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and they were sort of de facto sponsored by Russia, which could see a lot of benefit in having frozen conflicts in, inside Georgian, inside Georgia's na- international borders. Since 2008, so, so the war in 2008 went, went, went particularly badly for Saakashvili. He was humiliated, the Russian tanks um, pushed back the Georgian soldiers, etc. And they were driving around Georgia, pretty much doing as they want, going, going to military bases, blowing up military hardware. Um, you know, absolutely unchecked. It was, it was incredible to watch. Um, and that was sort of the start of the decline of the popularity of Saakashvili. And then within five years, he was out of office. The year before, his party had lost power. And this other group called the Georgian Dream Coalition, sponsored by a guy called Bezina uh, Bezina Ivanashvili, who's uh, Georgia's richest man, he's a billionaire. He, looked, he earned all his money in 1990s Russia, he was sponsoring the Children's Dream coalition government, which won an election. And he was, he became prime minister for a year from 2012. And then since then, he's been considered the sort of the power behind the throne of, um, of the Children Dream. He's, he doesn't hold an official position, but I think every, all the analysts consider him really pulling the strings, etc. Now, it's basically been, in, in the last 18 months, particularly maybe two years, Georgia's westward trajectory has really gone askew to, the, to, to such an extent that in December, when the EU was considering Moldova, Ukraine and Georgia as, as potential candidate countries, they were sort of quite impressed with, with obviously quite impressive what Moldova and Ukraine had been doing and, and gave them pound, pound the back and, and shifted them along the way a bit. But with Georgia, they said, no, 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 this is not working out for you guys anymore. Your rule of law, your commitments to human rights, etc., the values of the EU, you're not sticking by them. So they hand them a 12 point plan and said, You've got a year to sort all this out. Now, 
if you speak to any normal Georgia, ordinary Georgians, they will basically say the Georgian dream has been steering the country away from this EU future that 85% of the people want. It pays lip service to the idea of being an EU member, of upholding EU values, etc. But actually, it's undermining its own argument to be one, if you see what I mean. So it's picked various rows with the judiciary. It's tried to load, the Georgian dream has loaded the judiciary in Georgia with um, its own um, people. It's, it's interest in LGBT rights is incredibly low. It is. So a very close alliance with the Georgian Orthodox Church, which is a very conservative, and LGBT parade, etc. rallies of what well, can be a very dangerous thing to go and get involved in in, in Tbilisi. A cameraman was killed a couple of years ago filming one, and people get regularly beaten up, that sort of thing. Kashakashvili, this charismatic uh, ex georgian president, he turned up, he'd been in exile in Ukraine since leaving. Not quite, but for most of the time, he, he left Georgia in, in 20, after he left Georgia in 2013, and he was quite a senior official in Ukraine. And he ended up, he decided to come out of exile voluntarily and smuggled his way back into Georgia in 2021, November or October 2021, whereupon he was immediately arrested and put into prison, and his health was deteriorated. And the EU is very concerned that he. Certainly the photos look very bad and he may or may not be dying, well no one's sure. But anyway, the Georgian Dreamer are not giving him and not allowing him to receive foreign medical care, etc. So all this is causing a huge ruckus between the Georgian Dream and um George's traditional EU partners, uh, or traditional since uh, two thousand and three, two thousand and four. In I think it was twenty eighteen, Salome Zubarashili was elected, directly elected as George's president. Now, she is French. She has French citizenship. She's an ethnic Georgian, but she, she grew up in France. She was actually France's ambassador to Georgia for a while. So she is obviously hugely pro-Europe, pro-EU, pro-France, that sort of thing. And she's really, so the dynamics now, she's come out as president, which is nominally a, a ceremonial role, and she's opposing, directly opposing the Georgian Dream's idea of this foreign agents law and, 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 and how they want to do, you know, how they want to, the direction they want to take the country, et cetera. So you've got this incredible power struggle, which has come out of all this mess between the, the president, whose role is largely ceremonial. And although she's, she's not a member of the Georgian Dream, they gave her their backing when she was elected in 2018. You see, you've got her versus the Georgian Dream Government Coalition, which is basically run and financed by a Russian, uh, a Georgian who made his billions in Russia. So it's a real struggle between West and Russia for control of Georgia at the moment. Thank you very much for that, James. Just one question for you from me. What do you think happens now? You said that the, the government has sort of backed down on the bill, but it doesn't sound as if they've scrapped it entirely. Are they going to try again? How, how might they do that? And, and what happens to the protesters? Are they, are they going to go, are they going to, do you think they're going to disperse or, or will they continue keeping, applying pressure to the government? So on the protesters, street level politics in Georgia is a really powerful and, and very visible and, and very common thing. You, you often get protests in, in Georgia and, and big ones. The Parliament building is right in the centre of Tbilisi and it's, it's a small city and it, and it gets jammed for the people and, and, and they can have a real impact. So I'd expect the protesters to keep up their demonstrations. They've certainly been, I mean, they certainly, they, they certainly feel they've got an awful lot to fight for. They, they, they feel they're fighting for their future essentially and they're getting a lot of certainly ver verbal support from the West, from the US, from Zelensky's weighed in and said he wants the protesters to win, all this sort of thing. So I, I'd expect the pressure to be maintained on the streets by, by protesters. As far as the Georgian Green government is concerned and, and, and how they're going to, as I said, they, they've said they're going to launch a consultation session with the public to try and win over more support. Now, I can't see, I mean, I'm sort of, Trying, trying to look into a crystal ball here, I can't see them suddenly persuading most Georgians that this is a great But I also, they, they prove incredibly stubborn and single-minded in, in the way they do things. 
over the last um, 11 years. And I wouldn't expect them to back down entirely. I'd expect them to come out with a watered down version of this law, which they will possibly try to get through parliament again. And yeah, then it's in, then it's up to protesters to, to decide what to do and, and to, uh, and for the president, Sir Robert Shilly, to decide what to do as well. And she, she, she really lent huge support. Her intervention was critically important, I think on Tuesday when she said she stood with the protesters against Georgia's government. Thank you for all of that, James. Just a quick note from me to our listeners. Uh, Dom Nichols has had to go because he's going to be talking to the um, Belarusian opposition leader, Svetlana Tiskanuskaya, this afternoon. So we'll hear from Dom tomorrow about his conversation with her. I think he was at a press conference uh, yesterday and has now got a little bit more time with Svetlana. So we'll be hearing from Dom tomorrow on on his interview there. Um so no time for Dom's final thoughts, unfortunately. And unfortunately, we also have to have to keep pretty tight to time today. So, James, just for your final thought, can I can I ask, I mean, please talk about what you would like. But I, I'd be curious just to your thoughts on, on what this might mean for Russian influence in the region and how this might impact, if at all, Ukraine. I think Russia's influence in the region is directly linked to, uh, and, and I'm, when I say the region, I'm talking about the South Caucasus and Central Asia here, um, it's peripheral. It's directly linked to how it's performing in the war. There's there is very strong propaganda, Russian propaganda, as we know, in South Caucasus and Georgia and in Central Asia as well. And if they're able to find their feet on the battlefield and project a, a more successful Russian military operation in Ukraine, I think they will naturally grow stronger. They're this sort of impact, their sort of influence on ordinary people in the South Caucasus and in Central Asia will 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 grow. I, I, I think the Kremlin has been looking at how it's kind of lost a bit of control over Armenia, which is next door to, to Georgia, in the last well, in the last six or twelve months really. And Armenia has looked to the EU and to the US for help in sorting out its problems with uh, Azerbaijan. Over over the weekend I think it was the EU started a two-year monitoring mission on the border of Azerbaijan and Armenia, which is a huge step for, for, for EU uh, influence and intervention in the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict. And, and Kremlin and Baku are furious about it. And, and so the Kremlin tried to flex its muscles in, in Georgia and pull its strings there, which, as I've described, it has indirectly and directly some, some strong influence in Georgia, and, and it was desperate to, to, to pull out. So I think... What we see happening in Ukraine and the strength that the Kremlin and Putin is able to project is directly influences and directly impacts its neighbours. In Central Asia, I think I said last week, we've seen an uptick in in um, business deals and influence that the Kremlin has been able to uh, get done and Russian business people have been able to get done in Central Asia only in the last few months. And that coincides with Russia stabilizing, stabilizing their front line in Donbass and, and in Kherson, and even making some, taking some ground on, around Bakhmut, etc. I don't think this is lost on, on, on ordinary people in, in Kazakhstan, in Georgia, in Azerbaijan, etc. I think they, they see Putin regaining his, uh, his, his, his vigor almost. He's rebounded from a terrible summer, and I think they see him as, as strong again. And that has always been the Kremlin's biggest trump card. You know, we are strong, stick with us. So if you see a stronger Russia, a stronger Kremlin, if they start to do better in Ukraine, then you'll see their, uh, the Kremlin's influence grow in Georgia, in Central Asia. Thank you, James, and thank you, Dom. Last week, I spoke to Katerina Stepanenko, a Russia analyst at the Institute for the Study of War. Here is our conversation. Well, Katerina, it's really great to have you on the line. Thank you so much for joining us. Just to start with, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background? Of course, yeah. My name is Katerina Stepanenko. I'm a Russia analyst at the Institute for the Study of War at Washington, D.C., I focus a lot of my research on mobilization, uh, recruitments, 
into Russian armed forces, as well as information warfare and Russian nationalist groups. However, I've also focused on uh, producing daily maps with my colleagues at the GON team, as well as working on the daily updates, the situational updates that come out about any ground maneuvers that are happening in Ukraine and just the progress of the Russian war. So can we start with that, as you described the daily maps that you create with the team? Can you talk us through how you do that? Just, you know, be as detailed as you like, really, because I think for many journalists listening and many listeners in general, like actually knowing the process that goes into creating this is really interesting because it's something we're looking at all the time, really. I would probably say that we we read a lot. I mean, there's a lot of sources that go into it. All of it is open source. We do not get any information from foreign intelligence or Ukrainian, British, any type of intelligence whatsoever. So everything that we get is open source. We use satellite imagery, commercially available, as well as we also track any type of textual analysis. So Ukrainian statements, Russian statements, Russian government statements versus Russian mill blogger statements. And, you know, after working on this for quite some time, you start to paint a picture in your head and understand which sources are likely to report in a particular manner. And it helps us really understand how it essentially works, what their biases are, and how usually they would present information. So it really comes to collecting a lot of data from all variety of different sources, any type of imagery that we get, any type of you know traces that we can follow and maybe discover something else, but then also comparing and contrasting that information. It's really understanding how to categorize your sources, how to analyze them, what have they said in the past, where have they lied, where have they said the truth. And it's a pretty unique combination of sources that we have, and it's been pretty good in both assessing for our battleground offensive operations, but also for understanding um, how to map. Would it be possible to ask about a specific example? I mean, so at the moment, obviously, this interview might go out in a week's time. We're recording on the 3rd of March. But the focus for journalists and for the world is on Bakhmut and on the battle there, which might be heading towards a conclusion at some point, we think. And just to repeat, we're recording this on the 3rd of March, so we don't know where it's going to go. But could you talk us through maybe how you've looked at that area of the map and maybe the patterns you've seen over the past eight months? Because just to put everything you said onto a sort of practical example. I mean, situation Bakhmut provides a lot of information for us. There's a lot of sources on the ground. That is one thing I want to preface is that there's different levels of information that is available from different portions of the front line. Currently, we have the least visibility on the southern axis, so Zaporizhia Oblast or southern Ukraine, so Kherson Oblast, because simply there's not a lot of mill bloggers on the ground that would otherwise provide information straight from the ground, and Ukrainians tend to focus on operational silence, which is totally understandable as to not undermine their operations. But that is not the case for Bakhmut. We do see a lot of information on the ground. We obviously have Prigozhin, who records himself and claims that his forces are advancing uh, on particular days. And we use that information in accordance also with tracking what Ukrainian soldiers are saying, where we have previously seen um, geolocations to kind of assess the validity of the claims. A lot of times you will see that Russian sources will overextend, overstretch their claims of where they got. So, for example, when Russians captured Solidar, there was a lot of reporting from Russian sources claiming that they've also captured Krasnohora and all of the settlements just west of Solidar or northwest of Solidar. And that was not necessarily the case. We did not see any evidence for that. And these settlements fell a lot later than what they've claimed to be. But because we know the pace of the advance, that Russians move, you know, typically like 100 meters per day, we were able to map it as what we have the claims level layer, essentially, which helps us represent where Russians believe that they are. Not necessarily means that they are there, but that's something that they're claiming. And using that analogy really helps us to understand, you know, what they perceive their advances to be, but also to distinguish what actually can be truth and what actually cannot be truth. But Bakhmut is kind of similar to what we've seen before in Luhansk area as well. We've seen a lot of reports 
from Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, and whereas different axes, for example, Krimina Svatova, we don't get nearly as much visibility because it's not a dense populated area. It's not very urban. It's a lot of fields. And we really track our, a lot of our understanding of what's going on from limited Ukrainian statements that we get, but also some daily reports from units on the ground, that Russian units on the ground. So, for example, the Barsh units, they have their own Telegram channel. And that is kind of how we go about this. Can I ask a slightly potentially silly question? But if you're watching these Telegram groups, are you in the group? Do you have to be admitted in? Do they know you're there? How does that work? No, you, you don't actually. You have like a preview function on Telegram. And you can watch it from above. There are some videos that do require you to have like a downloaded Telegram channel. You know, so the, the not essentially in the browser, but in the app. Anything that is longer than, I believe, three minutes will appear as you need to view this in the app. But mm. overall, it's open. There's, you know, obviously these mill bloggers and Telegram channels are interested in growing their audiences. They're kind of what a normal blogger would do their intent is to increase their audience. And that's why we are able to access it. And that's why we are seeing a lot of Western media also pick up on that and incorporate that in their reporting as um, given that we don't have much of visibility, satellite imagery is challenging around this time of year because of clouds. So whatever information we can get to assess where Russians could be is super useful for us. You mentioned at the beginning that one of the things you do is to look through the sort of pro-Russian telegram groups. What kind of things do you see there? And if you were to sort of assess the morale, the mood right now, what would you say? So a daily telegram, you know, post uh, for Russian mill blogger would be something along the lines of a situational report from the ground. So some of them either Kremlin affiliated or DNR affiliated or Wagner affiliated telegram channels publish their own information from their sources about what's going on on the front lines. That can vary for different mill bloggers. You know, some are specifically around Bakhmut, so they will only write about what is going on about in Bakhmut. There's also others that focus on the entire front line or specific part of the front line. So they post that. A lot of times they basically discuss any current events. So, you know, there's some slower days and then some that are uh, very busy where they talk about, you know, for example, Dansk Oblast. I, we've probably gathered way too much information about that because every single mill blogger on this planet had something to say about it and they all differed. That was the reported sort of incursion on the border with the Ukrainians. Yes, yes. Yeah. What did you make of watching that? It's coming because that's been a rolling story here in the newsroom. To be honest with you, the whole situation is extremely confusing. And even Russian sources are very confused about the numerous of claims that came out. They frankly even criticized some of the official standing towards the situation, saying that Russia is not taking strong enough measures to pre- prevent further border incursions as well as border crossings. Most of the feedback that we received from the ultra-nationalist groups on Telegram channels was Russia needs to strengthen its border security as well as conduct some sort of retaliatory strikes against Ukrainians and find and punish anyone who was involved in this incursion. We also observed some calls for Russia to declare all of Ukrainian armed forces as terrorist groups, uh, which I found to be very interesting. So overall, you know, it, it was a collection of demands, which is what we often see for mill bloggers. They have this perceived vision of how Russia needs to conduct this war. So whenever their vision is not achieved by whatever action the Kremlin or Russian Ministry of Defense is taking, they will go on their blogs and they will complain about it. And they will say, this is how you need to do it. And if you don't do it this way, then I'm sorry, uh, Defense Minister Shoigu, you're doing this wrong. You're not going to win this war. You're not committing all of your efforts to conduct this war. So in that sense, you know, because they have all of these different opinions of how the war needs to be conducted and, you know, they're pushing for them and they're reposting, amplifying their claims, I don't think that Putin has the capacity to address all of their visions of this this war. You know, it's just simply impossible for Putin to do everything that they ask of him, given current Russian military capacities on the ground. We have some mill bloggers that 
claim that they need to start a fight with NATO, for example. And that's given the constitution of Russian forces and the failures that they've taken right now in Ukraine, it's not very possible. One of the most prominent topics, of course, is military failures. That is something that mill bloggers are experts on. They take any footage that exists from the front lines and analyze it and basically find the culprits within the Russian Ministry of Defense to accuse. So the most recent military failure that we saw was Vuhledar, you know, when Russians have tried an assault on Vuhledar but got trapped in a mine field and also had a couple of their tanks destroyed in a as they were trying to advance in a column, not very doctrinally sane decision on their part. And that had generated significant backlash, calls for, you know, removal of certain officials from Russian Ministry of Defense. And that is pretty normal for them. That is something that we've been tracking. And it's only been intensifying throughout this war as they see more military failures happen. If you could encapsulate what you make of their current morale, these people who are posting, how would you describe it? I think it's very important for anyone who reads this mill bloggers to realize that these people are pro-war. They're not calling to end this war. They have been supporting this war since before this war was actually happening on the ground. A lot of them have been fighting with DNR, LNR units in the past. So to them, this is something that the Kremlin had to do since the beginning of their uh, involvement in Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast in 2014. So that is a very important point, is that no matter how many military failures or how dissatisfied they are with the Russian military command, they will still continue to push the narrative that we need to do everything in our power to win this war, and win this war not partially, but actually reach the all of the Ukrainian borders up to Poland and so on. And so in that sense, their morale, you know, they're dissatisfied, they hate the way that the progress of the war is going. But it doesn't mean that they are going against, you know, the the core idea of this war. And in many cases, they don't even blame Putin for this. They blame the military command. They say that Putin had this grand vision for this war, but military command is not achieving that. There's, of course, some that are very critical of Putin, namely Igor Girkin, former uh, Russian officer who had been participating with Donetsk and Luhansk, LNR and DNR, essentially, um, in 2014 and had been disgraced ever since. But that is not a widespread opinion. Most people within these groups think that Putin has the right mindset for this. He is just whoever he has that are executing this plan, they're not doing enough, in their opinion. You mentioned that another thing you look at is... Russian recruitment and finding troops for this army. We have estimates of how high the casualties have been and and how devastating the ratio of killed to uh, wounded has been. What have you seen over the past year to do with this? What what patterns are you detecting in terms of mobilisation in Russia? We published a really great report this weekend on just kind of our timeline of how the volunteer recruitment process was going in Russia. At the beginning of the war, we've seen some limited volunteer recruitment movements online, which have existed in Russia prior for previous, you know, engagements and involvement in Syria or um, any other type of conflicts worldwide. So essentially, the, the meal bloggers that we're seeing, they have established networks of nationalists and that have been used for recruitment for the Kremlin's covert participation in global affairs. At the beginning of the war, these groups have been doing some limited recruitment uh, campaigns. But over the summer, we've noticed that Putin doubled down on these recruitment campaigns and seemingly allowed these groups to operate in the open and recruit from essentially from the Russian domestic audience, right? Over the summer, Putin had a choice. His choice was... I need to either call up mobilization, mobilization of specifically reservists, or I can go and try to employ these ultra-nationalist communities that have already been recruiting for me former special forces elements and former airborne troops and veterans and reservists to participate in operations in Syria and basically 
make sure that I don't have any risks to my regime with this very unpopular mobilization. So he was faced with that risk around May, which is when Russians started to cease their operations around Kharkiv city. You know, they were a lot closer to Kharkiv city at the beginning of the war than what they were in May. And then we also stopped seeing movements on the Izum Slavyansk line, which the idea was to kind of complete the cauldron from uh, Kharkiv Oblast while the other grouping was pushing from Lysychansk. And I think that's when they realized that they need reserve power. And Putin sided with the volunteer recruitment campaign. And over the summer, we saw both the increase for advertisements across Russia for Wagner. You know, Wagner was allowed to do like billboards to recruit people, which was really strange. And that's not something that we've seen in the past, you know, at least in the open eye to a regular Russian that is not involved with this war or has been previously a reservist, for example. And then we also saw uh, the rise of the volunteer battalions campaign. So that was the Russian Ministry of Defense equivalent of that, where they tried to financially incentivize Russians across the, the country to join volunteer battalions and then their promises of state benefits and also pretty high uh, salaries and enlistment benefits. And that kind of didn't work out for Putin at the end of the day, because Around Kharkiv, when Ukrainians conducted a sweeping counteroffensive in Kharkiv Oblast, following like 10 days, we saw that Putin announced mobilization. And those two events really tell us about, A, he was very hesitant about calling mobilization and likely anticipated that his volunteer recruitment campaigns that he had launched on Russian internet and in Russian public would be sufficient to generate combat effective forces. But also we've noticed that his downplaying of what this mobilization is and that it's only affecting like 300,000 people tells us that he's a risk adverse actor who wanted to refrain from doing this option for a very long time, but he just didn't have any other option of reinforcing his lines at that time and also making sure that he could regain the initiative on the front lines. We also see that a lot of Western officials state that Putin has been consistently delaying his second wave of mobilization, which follows the pattern of Putin not being fully committed to this war, rather taking all measures available to win this war. He's he's still very concerned about the implications on his regime. Moving away from recruitment, can we talk a little bit about the information war? I think people in the West certainly have been aware of Putin's troll army and the effective information campaign waged in the past. Something that we've been picking up a lot on the podcast is this idea that a lot of the Russian disinformation campaign is actually not aimed at us in the UK or America or Western countries or other Ukrainian allies. It's actually aimed at the global south, the global east. It's going in a different direction. And that's not something we really have a lot of sight over, I think. So would you like to talk a little bit about that? What kind of things are they saying and is it effective? We're seeing a trend. We, we Obviously, a lot of Russian disinformation has been targeting the West for a while. I mean, we've seen us being quoted in numerous publications as the ultimate source of information before the war regarding the situation in Donbass, for example. I believe Western governments have been doing a really good job at trying to prevent Russian disinformation, especially regarding to war in Ukraine, namely elevating Ukrainian sources, using Ukrainian official statements and Ukrainian data to kind of elevate the frontline situation, not just solely focusing on what Russian officials are stating. Now, Russia is not completely giving up on its disinformation war and had found a different frontier to fight on. And that is namely going after Latin America, Southeast Asia, Africa. Their campaigns in those regions are not really focusing about the situation in Ukraine, but rather are focusing on local issues that are pertaining to that region. So, for example, in Africa, a lot of Russian disinformation focuses on this anti-colonial state sentiment, you know, and emphasizing West is a colonial power and Russia is fighting against the colonial power. You know, Russia has been so good at issues of race throughout its Soviet legacy, and Russia used to be a multicultural empire. And that is one of the lines of rhetoric. In uh, predominantly Muslim countries, they're pushing the narrative that 
Russia is a great state that tolerates Islam and, you know, has republics that practice Islam and that kind of line of narrative as well. In Latin America, there's a lot of information about Russia is a, has socialist tendencies and it has an infrastructure that provides benefits for its residents and healthcare, And that is also a line of effort that we're seeing. So it's not necessarily that they're using the war to kind of push their agenda, but more that they're trying to focus on unrelated topics to highlight why Russia is the beacon of hope. I mean, another disinformation campaign that comes to my head is Russia's use of traditional values and religion. Russia constantly claims that they're trying to protect traditional values and that, you know, Christianity is very important. And those lines of effort, you know, we, we see them both online as well as on them trying to message through their officials similar statements. And I cannot attest right now to what extent this is very successful, and that I don't track it as closely. However, that's something that we need to watch out for, that they're not necessarily going to focus on war in Ukraine uh, with those regions, but more about uh, what Russia brings otherwise and how Russia can essentially support the existing campaigns that are ongoing in those regions. When we talk about disinformation, I mean, I think you've given a really comprehensive and detailed account of what it looks like in different places. But what are we talking about exactly? Is this Facebook groups, posts from embassies? It's a whole combination of things, to be honest with you. It's uh, Telegram. We're seeing rise of Telegram in other regions outside of Russia. There was a really great investigation by Digital Forensics Lab, I believe, that just came out that talked about the rise of Telegram channels, Russian Telegram channels. They also use Facebook, they use Twitter, they use Instagram. In fact, there was even instances when like student groups on Instagram, there is a use of student groups, Russian student groups across different regions for pushing the Russian cultural agenda. And it's all different types of disinformation. It's also existing networks through RT, for example. Obviously, RT has been uh, very restricted lately in the Western world. However, RT does still continue some operations on the ground. It's all different type of messaging. Officials, you know, Russian officials during their visits also tailor a lot of their rhetoric to the country that they're visiting, promoting whatever values that align with the region. So all of those aspects are the way that Russia conducts its uh, information warfare worldwide. You've obviously spent the entire year looking at this invasion, looking at this war. Are there any sort of myths or misunderstandings or miscomprehensions that you'd sort of like to correct from either the media or civilians following the war and going away with certain impressions? Are there any big ones for you that you you kind of want to say again, like, no, it's not like that, it's actually like this, or like, no, it's more complicated than that? Yeah, there's a couple of narratives that we see emerge as a result of Russian disinformation efforts, in especially targeting Western media. Namely, I want to preface that there's a lot of officials, such as Dmitry Medvedev, for example, deputy chairman of Russian Security Council. He's used a lot in promoting some sort of very explosive narratives. Um, Namely, we see him appear a lot with nuclear threats and so on. He does not nearly have as much power as he's given a lot of times in the media space. Russia does these statements on purpose. That is so to deter Western support for Ukraine, to scare the West about, you know, its conventional powers. So, for example, nuclear weapons is something that we see a lot emerging in the information space. And just to assess the the value of the source, it's very important to track all of these narratives in combination with previous Russian statements. We know that Putin makes very vaguely encrypted nuclear threats throughout his regime. He's done this for many, many years, and it's very similar to what he's talking about all the time. I also want to preface that a lot of Russian statements, like Kremlin statements that we see, so Putin's address to Federal Assembly, for example, on the February 21st, are not new. This is the narratives that they have been following for years. They say almost the same stuff pretty frequently. And when writing about Kremlin statements, we really need to compare previous statements that they've made and how they differ. Not everything that they say is an inflection, and it should not be 
always perceived and reported on as inflection. Well, Katerina, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's hugely, hugely appreciated by us. Thank you. It was a pleasure chatting. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine The Latest as soon as it is released, do refer to podcast apps. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear, and today on Twitter, Emily Hill.